Okay guys, this is the third part of the follow-up to the individual breakdown on that air conditioning for the RV system. Um, we already went over insulation and uh, by now you probably have three to four inches of polyiso on your walls, uh, giving you somewhere between 15 and 20 R value. You've got your overhead. Oh, by the way, this is not going to be a five minute video. <laughs> I, as I was laying out the tabs, I was like, no effing way. I'm just going to do it like I normally do it. And uh, if it ends up being 20 or 30 minutes, then, you know, it is what it is. Got to have the information accurate. Um, but anyways, uh, so you got your uh, reflective uh, barrier, radiant barrier on the roof because uh, your solar panels are fully covering. You got full coverage up there. Um, and so now we're moving on to building all those components together because your RV is now ready for the wiring and the components to go in to power your air conditioning unit. Um, so I'll go ahead and close this tab on that note. We'll come back to uh, the chrome tabs in just a second. I'm going to pull up this list on the side here. So if you uh, needed a couple pointers here on the windows or just a basic full list of everything that's going on, this is my list that I made for this video. Uh, in doing the windows to black them out, the easiest and most cheap way to go is just to use oil-based black paint. Uh, make sure that uh, if you have any tint on the window and it's uh, bubbling or peeling or anything, that has to come off first before you um, apply the paint or it's just not going to look good, it's not going to adhere and that's important once you get the layers of uh, insulation over the window because you're not going to be able to access it anymore. Um, so yeah, get that window all nice and uh, stripped down and then clean it with some rubbing alcohol and uh, get a razor blade in there and get anything out of the little crevices that might interfere with adhesion and then go ahead and lay down uh, some rust-oleum oil-based paint in black. The, uh, the finish doesn't matter. You can get flat or glossy or whatever. Uh, I got like a flat for mine and it worked out really good. From the outside you don't see anything but shine. It looks just like a limo tint or something. And then after that's all dry and ready to go, you could put an inch of polyiso behind that just to level things up with the walls themselves. Um, so cut that out, match the glass. You're going to have gaps and everything between the uh, poly ISO that you cut out and the aluminum framing that houses the uh, screen and whatnot. So use a little bit of foam filler to fill in those gaps, but make sure you don't overdo it so that it's, you know, puffing out, sticking out, because you're eventually going to put some uh, utility plywood right over the window itself and board it up, essentially. It's just going to look like a boarded up window. It's not that big a deal because uh, the next step here, you're going to be laying down three to four inches of poly ice. So I'm going to go ahead and recommend four inches because you need at least three, but it kind of makes no sense to do three. The one inch sheets are uh, almost just as expensive as the two inch sheets. So just get two of the two inch sheets uh, and cover your entire unit, all the walls and ceiling if you can. Um, I would not worry too much about the ceiling being four inches because um, you're going to have a really good radiant barrier on that, um, the solar panels that is. Um, so if you want to go just two inches on the ceiling and stick to four inches on the walls, then um, that works out really well. And again, uh, to adhere that down, a lot of people will say, oh, use like liquid nails or something. All that stuff is really heavy and messy and what I found works really well is just using the uh, the foam gap filler. You just put a, a nice little pattern on the back of some squiggly lines all around the perimeter, um, zigzag in the middle so you don't have any gaps that are more than, I don't know, eight inches wide. And then um, you sm it smashes down real easy because it's just foam and yeah, you want to get it nice and thin. Don't don't lightly lob it on the wall and leave areas where the uh, gap filler is thicker because when it starts to, um, what do you call it, harden, it expands 
and then your wall is going to kind of puff out uneven. So if you want it to lay nice and flat, smash it down really well. Put some, you know, plywood um, with some joints like some uh, two by two wood or something that's pressing it against the wall until that is fully cured. Um, it should typically take just a few hours to cure uh, enough to where you can take the wood off and then uh, probably about 12 hours before it's totally cured because the layer should be really really thin it's not like waiting for a thick uh, gap to fill and dry uh, that would normally take a, a day or so to fully cure um, so there's that you can just lay it down foam it in get the second layer foam it in move on go all the way around your unit okay so you got that and then uh, get your seams nice and tight together um, you don't want to leave a gap and then fill it with the foam because that's going to be really uneven when we go to put on the um, final layer of utility plywood uh, that thin 1 8 inch veneer on the outside too so you don't have a RV that just looks like it's a big giant foam cooler <laughs> uh, so in, in those gaps you're going to put foil tape um, as long as the panels are butted up together really nice and tight so you just uh, lay a nice seam of foil tape, that'll seal everything in. Um, I recommend doing that on the seams and all the way around the trim because uh, closed cell foam technically is supposed to be in a sealed insta installation, installation due to the fact that there is a micro amount of off gassing that can happen and it's not exactly um, supposed to be in your environment where you're breathing the air especially if that environment is 100% sealed up as it will probably will be when you're running your air conditioning unit so get that uh, foil tape and seal everything up nice and tight airtight so that is not a concern and then <clears throat> after that you can do the same method um, or if you prefer something else dude chill out cat just ran across my my back like, like a spring wall or something just go crazy sometimes crazy um, yeah same same process it's really thin so lay down some foam press it up you got that done good deal so now your walls are all done your ceilings all done your roof is covered and I'm gonna use for example my recommendations um, so everything I specify in here is my recommendation. If you go less than that or more than that, don't blame me um, because this is, uh, this is the numbers and materials that I'm saying will work. Um, that's going to be 1800 watts on the roof. If you've seen my videos and my other solar panel configurations, don't follow that to a T because um, you can't. I can only get 1500 watts because I left my uh, roof vents on there you definitely should remove those roof vents and also lay down the panels in a uniform pattern I did like this funky Tetris style straight on the sides and then uh, sorry my phone falls down and then it stops recording because I have it set to stop on shake <laughs> shake to stop anyways it uh don't follow that pattern make sure your your panels are all uniform nice in a row two by two by two by two all the way across the roof and if you do that you can fit 1800 watts on a uh, 23 foot rv roof um so anyways <clears throat> i would love to redo mine in that configuration but gosh darn it's so much work uh i'm just gonna settle for now with my 1500 watts and uh say la vie <laughs> so next you're gonna wire your panels together for that um, I don't recommend using the Y splitter style connectors you might see all over the internet um, why don't I have some here we go I know I pulled up some tabs with inf relevant information like you might see these guys on the internet and um, I keep on asking all around but every manufacturer keeps saying oh they're only 14 gauge dude and the MC4 standard is supposed to be 10 gauge and so the MC branch MC4 branch connectors are rated at uh, 30 amp but 14 gauge is only 15 amp so 
I do not recommend using these. There is a one to four connector, which uh, I bought from Renogy and they are 10 gauge. Renogy is just a, a big name Amazon brand, but they're actually kind of branching out everywhere. I don't <clears throat> recommend them or stand behind them. If you choose to go with them, it's your choice. They are a little pricier. Uh, and it's primarily for good customer service and warranty, but seeing as they're so brand new still relatively to the marketplace um, You know the warranty is what it is who knows if they're gonna disappear in a year or two and then Companies that can only warranty their units as long as they're alive <laughs> anyways, so uh, The here we go the one to three connectors are ideal. I did notice that the connections are kind of rotated. See, these ones are vertical, which allows you to press on the pins of the side very easily when you're removing it. But these are rotated in the opposite direction, which means it would be very hard to get your little fingers into those uh, clips if you want to disconnect it. So if you're looking for that, uh, I'm trying to find one that is rotated the other way. But in general, that's what you're looking for is the one to three. And then that's going to allow you to group three panels together and then you would connect your extension cable onto this end, which needs to be 10 AUG, MC4 connections, and only as long as you need to get to the next group of panels. So I think typically they, they come in like five and 10 foot lengths. Um, generally, probably just a five footer in between each group. On this, you're gonna have six groups because three times six is 18. Um, so six groups means five connections because you're only counting the middle. So five connectors is what you would need on the tenant AUG MC4 connection side, unless for some reason one of the groups ended up being uh, further apart, then maybe you need to map that out ahead of time and make sure that five foot is gonna be sufficient for your design. Okay, the next, they come down to your charge controller and on the positive lead, you're going to want an inline breaker. Um, I did not pull anything up for that. Let's see if I can do that um, real quick, real slow. I don't do anything quick. Inline breaker of 40 amp, is it we're going to go with? Or what are we doing here? Oh, no, no, 20 amp, because this is for the uh, line coming in. So uh, the line should be able to handle up to 30 amp your solar panels will max out if you happen to get the perfect aim rule and everything at only 15 amps so you should never ever blow this it's more of just a safety concern and if there's ever a short or something weird happens um, and that goes right between uh, the solar panels and the charge controller uh, you've got two lines of negative and positive coming in uh, breakers always go on the positive side so on the positive lead uh, you'll stop that into the breaker and it will come out and continue to the charge controller give yourself a couple feet or, or at least a minimum of 12 inches before it hits the charge controller don't put it too close uh, that may lead to it um, um, popping unnecessarily and also kind of makes it hard to work with things uh, when you're disconnecting and moving things around or adding components into the system Anyways moving on uh, Next you're gonna want it right now in the market 40 amp controllers are perfect for anything under 2,000 watts um, It wasn't always that way you, Before you could only get up to like a uh, thousand or 1100 watts on a 40 amp controller uh, Because the ones that were actually marketed up to 36 and 48 volt were unattainable as far as the price range goes but now there is more than a handful of them available so you're luckier than i was a year and a half ago when i built my system um so i recommend i think even ames has one um and it's pretty reasonably priced it's like under 300 dollars for a 40 amp controller that can go up to 150 volts and output 48 volt battery bank um, charging capabilities so in this scenario, we're going to be running 120 uh, volt in because of the six times uh, roughly 20 volts is what the panels run. Um, 
gives you 120 volts and you never want to push the ceiling on your charge controller so if you were to try and do even more maybe seven getting up to 2100 watts which um i'll tell you guys if you're mounting your panels flat you can actually exceed the rating of the charge controller's wattage as long as what actually what the panels actually produced is not exceeding the wattage that goes in the controller and the reason i say that is because flat mounting you lose like a minimum of 20 percent uh actually no 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 i want to say a minimum maybe 15 percent on a great day i'll never get 1800 watts out of a panel's configuration and when they're mounted flat and they don't have any tilt on them unless you're living somewhere right along the equator where you don't need any tilt keep that in mind <laughs> i'm talking about for my location of uh, southern california and other people in similar locations uh, so that's something to keep in mind when and when thinking about the max limitation of your charge controller um, so for this situation i probably won't even be putting uh, 1600 watts through the unit um, down to here it so if i went up to 2100 watts in panels i'm probably going to at best at the very very optimal scenario make up to 1900 watts which would still be under the controller's 2000 watt limit for 48 volt configurations okay so that's all said and done now we can go on to our battery bank um which um i didn't really i don't know if i put that in the right spot but that your battery connection will need a 40 amp inline breaker for the charge going out there same rule or scenario give it a little space from the controller don't put it too close um yeah so coming out i i went over the cable sizes down here so i'll get to that i guess so for this configuration i recommend 14.4 kilowatt hours which is basically 12 batteries at uh, their standard 12 volt 100 amp ratings so that's what most of advertisers and manufacturers are going to use um, whether it's uh, gel batteries agm batteries anything falling under the umbrella of sealed lead acid is going to be uh, blanking out here is going to be under the 12 volt 100 amp hour uh rating window so if you were to get 12 of those and put them together you're going to produce this kilowatt hours if you wanted to get lithium ion or go that route which i'll talk about in another video on batteries i don't recommend personally um, but if you want to take that chance and try that out then obviously uh, 14 kilowatt hours will be more than you need because you're um, going to be able to utilize more than 50 percent of the battery so if the goal is to get somewhere around six to seven kilowatt hours, uh, then that's all you need to do is buy maybe seven or eight kilowatt hours of uh, battery capacity because they can typically have a depth of discharge or DOD all the way down to 10% of the battery uh, before their manufacturer recommends to stop discharging it and, and reconnect it to its source all right so what size cables do you need for this kind of setup going back to the recommendation of sealed lead acid batteries i particularly use agm they're extremely reliable and um, um have very 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 minimal off gassing compared to traditional uh technologies the one of the benefits of glass mat is that it has this cycle where uh, I don't fully know how to explain it but it, it, it's, a, it's able to recycle the gases somehow through the glass mat to absorb them is what I believe that the explanation uh, said on the website I was reading so some people will say oh they don't actually have any off gassing but if they didn't they wouldn't have vents uh, ventilation on them and they do um, it just means that they are less susceptible under cycles of equalization where you're overcharging the batteries. That is when typically you're going to see the off-gassing on standard sealed lead acid batteries. And uh, with AGM, 
Okay, I'm going too much into that. That's going to be on the battery thing, the battery video. Anyways, moving on. So, interconnects there. 12 AUG is plenty. Um, sizing will be on another video. I'm going to try and get through this a little bit quicker. It's not a five minute video like I, I did on some of my other ones, but I'm still going to try to go quick here um, just so that you can see the full list. And then I will move on to a diagram uh, at the end that shows all the connections and layouts of these components. <coughs> Excuse me. So for the interconnects, 4 AUG is perfectly fine. 12 inch connectors times uh, 28 cables should be enough to wire 12 batteries up together. Um, and then from the battery to the collection terminals, where most of the components are going to be wired to. I prefer this method rather than connecting all the components directly to the battery terminals. It's just cleaner and uh, easier to manipulate when adding and removing components. Um, so you'll have these separate ter terminals which uh, you relocate closer to each other rather than having positive on the one end of your battery bank and then negative on the other end of your battery bank, you relocate both of them so that they're a little closer and more convenient for connecting devices and uh, they collect on these terminals, uh, which I will also link to in the description below along with all the components here that I'm talking about today. Uh, okay, so then from there to the inverter, you only need 8 odd cables, 24 inch should be fine because you're going to go from the terminals over to the inverter and it should be all these things should be close together. You're not putting your inverter on the other side of the RV. That is an absolute no-no. Anytime you're dealing with low voltages, shorter the wire, the better. So just keep everything as short as possible. You don't need to go crazy like scrunching the configuration so that you keep it under 12 inches. No, no, no. This is going to be perfectly fine. Um, so you're going to get ADOG to the inverter and then you're going to probably want to a controller for oh, oh no this is this is a charge controller you can go with 10 aug because that's only going to be putting out just under 40 amps where this is going to be closer to uh, maybe 65 or 70 amps so that's perfectly fine to go 10 aug you're going to need to pick up a battery disconnect which is going to go between the batteries and the collection terminal so that you can completely disconnect the batteries from the system and all of the components uh, anytime you're working on the uh, electrical and then between the negative terminal and all the other components you're going to have a shunt which is going to measure the uh, current that's flowing through the or flowing out of the batteries um, because most charge controllers don't have a way to measure that they don't include a shunt or a connection that hooks up to the negative terminal side to properly measure that. They can try to estimate based on where your voltage starts and lands at the end of the day, how much came out, but if you want it, a, a truly accurate reading, and you will after you start using your system, plus they're only like 20 or 30 bucks, spending all this money and not putting in a shunt to actually uh, measure and read the system would be uh, kind of asinine. Anyways, um, next for the inverter, um, you can pick up 2500 watt, 48 volt to 230 volt inverter. And I know a lot of people are very leery about buying things overseas and whatnot, but 230 volt inverters don't really exist on the US market because uh, everything in a uh, single, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, single phase electrical at that voltage is is all in Europe and Asia so we don't have that here uh, we do split phase um, on our systems so, so there's two phases that come together to make a 240 volt or 230 volt um, outlet in our in our uh, Western style connections our electrical connections so the only way to get that is to be shipping from overseas and typically that means you're gonna to have to go with eBay or some third-party website where you go directly to them 
So I prefer just to use eBay because you still have the buyer guarantee. You don't have to worry about something arriving not working. And as long as you get something that's rated for more than you're going to be using, um, which in this scenario you don't really have a choice, we're going to be using less than a thousand amps on the inverter. But since we're talking about 230 volt um, inverters, they have like a, a minimum starting point of around 2500 watts. And you're going to see even more popular to have these around 5,000, 6,000 and up because they don't really make this stuff for uh, small applications uh, just yet. I mean, th obviously they make them, it's just not mainstream is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so um, you can find this and here's proof. This is a 48 volt, 230 volt output. And this one's actually 1,000 watts. I don't know for sure if this is, yeah, yeah, it is. Okay, that's a thousand watts and that's 138 bucks. So it's, you're not gonna break the bake on that kind of thing. Just make sure that it is pure sign. And uh, if it, I know a lot of people say, oh, if it's too cheap, then it's not pure sign or you can't trust it. The price is coming down, guys. It, it, just because something is cheap doesn't mean it's not pure sign. If you wanted to ch check out the uh, the waveform output after you buy the unit and it's not true pure sign you can just return it because it's false advertising um, so you legitimately can research return it no no hassle but in my experience I've I've seen all these units coming through at uh, cheap prices and they put out a clean sine wave um, and so the device that you would do that with is an oscilloscope which looks, uh, let's see if I can, looks something like this. Um, if you have a local place, you can buy one of these and then just use it for that purpose and return it, uh, then it's no big deal. But they are kind of pricey if you were buying one to own. If you don't have something like that available, you can just uh, Google an electronic repair uh, facility and call them up and say, do you have an oscilloscope that I can, uh, you know, test my inverter on and, uh, plug that in to make sure it's working correctly and getting your uh, a pure sign output on the waveform. Uh, so there's that. Okay, too much time on that. Check. Um, and then to power the rest of your system, you want what's called a buck converter. You want to get a 48 volt stepping down to 12 volt, also known as a step down converter, depending on uh, where you're searching. Some people just call it whatever they feel like. Um, and then between the power cable and your battery, you're going to want another 20 amp inline breaker for the, the uh, converter there. Every new component you connect to the battery source should have a breaker in between the power line and the battery itself. Um, and that's it guys. The surface mount post is just something else, the terminals I was talking about here. So those posts, <clears throat> I'll put a link in the video in the description. Uh, but as far as showing them, I would have to do a little digging because I can't remember where I found the particular ones that I bought. Um, but definitely it'll be in the link in the description. And now I'm going to stop the video and uh, go draw up a quick diagram for you so you can see all these components wired together on a sheet. All right, I'll see you in just a few minutes. Okay, let me try this again. I mixed up my wires a minute ago. Um, that did not take just a couple minutes. <laughs> so I hope somebody appreciates this, doing all this information and writing, drawing up these diagrams. Um, here's your battery bank, here's your solar array, here's your charge controller, your inverter, your butt converter, and these are the positive and negative uh, breakers. I mean, sorry, not breakers, just uh, post terminals where everything is uh, collected up to. So you could call it a you know junction. Um, here you're gonna have your battery disconnect which goes in between the junction and the actual battery. It's on the positive lead and then on the negative lead between the junction and the battery, you have your shunt which is gonna measure the draw uh, coming off the battery so you know exactly how much you're using, what's using it, and all those sorts of deets. In the, the lines here, I use the different thicknesses to indicate the gauge of the line. The skinny line uh, is gonna be 10 gauge. The thicker line is going to be the 8 gauge, 
and the thickest line is going to be 4 gauge and then the dotted line I use to represent the skinnier 14 gauge. So every line in a DC system uh, uses stranded copper wire and then when we jump over outside of the inverter this 14 gauge is not stranded copper wire. Now obviously it's going to be uh, Sorry, I say, hate saying the word obviously, but it's going to be uh, standard building code wire, which is solid gauge 14. Um, and so yeah, that's the one discrepancy there on the wiring situation. And so then every positive line gets a breaker. So for example, coming in from the uh, solar panels, we got our 20 amp breaker over here. Going out to the batteries, we got our 40 amp breaker. Going out to the uh, system here for the line 230 volts at the air conditioner is going to be a 15 amp, 15 amp breaker. And then over here, uh, going out of the buck converter, you're going to have a 40 amp breaker on the 12 volt side. And then on this side, it's just a 10 amp breaker for the uh, line coming in because it goes in at 10 amps and out at 40 amps. Um, that's about it guys. Um, as you can see this is wired for 48 volts. I tried to match everything that I said in the spec sheet list. So this is the 12 batteries I mentioned wired in 48 volts. This is the 18 uh, solar panels wired in So it's wired in 120 volts at 15 amps. That's that. Have a good one.